Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Sal. I am joined today by Mark Wade. Needs no introduction. Hey, Mark. How are you, man? Good. Good. Uh, has been on the show a couple times, but these are, those have been more like 15-minute bursts. Uh, much more promotional. We will be promoting, obviously, but uh, but I'm excited because we're finally going to get a chance to jump into it. I've wanted you on the show for so many years, and I'm so excited to finally have you on here, man, to talk about comics and your work. Uh, we're going to talk about new and old, if that's cool with you. Absolutely. Uh, obviously. Uh, and uh, and and more. So uh, first of all, before we get anything uh, out of the way, I want to mention Batman Superman World's Finest uh, lives up to the name. It is a fine comic. Uh, thanks. Beautiful looking, uh, obviously, thanks to the work of Dan Mora, who has uh, not missed a week. Uh, it's no. been awesome. Uh, but also, uh, it's been a treat to read these characters set in a period that uh is formative you know it's the uh, yeah. it's the it's an older time but feels very modern was that the idea do you wanted to be like here's a chance for me to kind of jump into the like pre, you know pre minutia but yeah i mean it's it's not you know it's not a nostalgia trip it's still in continuity it's just yeah. you know the i didn't even request it the remit from dc was hey are you interested in writing a book about superman and batman that is set a little bit back in time so that we can play with the toys that are more classic than people, most people remember. So it feels like a book you can just hand anybody and they don't have to be up on current continuity. Right. Uh, and also provides us a place where we don't have to figure out how to team up Superman and Batman when one is on war world and the other one is, you know, doing something else. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I I love how you're you're taking an opportunity to be like, hey, um, also, you know, obviously, main stars Batman and Superman, yeah. but uh, look at the Doom Patrol, or look yeah. at the Metal Men, or you know, look at Simon Stagg, look at all these characters, Metamorpho, yeah. that uh, that normally don't, you know, they don't they don't pay the bills. You know, these right. are characters that are more fan favorite. Uh, is that was that kind of your like secret motivation? You're like, I want to get I want to get these Metal Men in here. I want to get these yeah. other characters in here, or. Yeah. I mean, it didn't, that wasn't from issue one, but what it was, was that you know, my goal is to tell you stories that you've never seen before and give you stuff you've never seen before. Right. And that was sort of the origin of the Doom Patrol showing up in the first arc and my realization that I've never seen Batman and the Doom Patrol share an adventure before. No one has. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we've never seen. And then it became, okay, well, you know, we've not seen this character, we've not seen that character and this character and this villain and that hero and this combination. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it kind of sprung from that. And then when it comes to, say, Metamorpho, um, it's, it has a lot more to do with, A, my love for Metamorpho, and B, the fact that I think I have an angle on him or had an angle on him that either hasn't been explored before or hasn't really been touched on in a while that I could really do something with. And that it's not as interesting for me to take characters that you already know well, you know, guest stars that you already know well, if I don't really have anything new or some new take or some new little something about them to yeah. add. But, you know, clearly I've been thinking about these characters for 55 years. So <laughs> I probably have something to say about them that you've never seen before. Now you say you love Metamorpho. What is it about that character that really appeals to you so much that you're like, oh, I really want to talk about him some more? But how how often uh, are they going to give you a Metamorpho mini? Right. Well, I think that the they did in 1994, and it and we can see that that <laughs> didn't, didn't exactly lead to the Metamorpho mania that we were hoping for. <laughs> True. Um, it yeah, a lot of it is just my science geek background, and you know, and knowing chemistry, and people, and and my frustration that people keep forgetting what Metamorpho's powers are, that they're right. not, he can just turn into any element, which a lot of characters can do. But if that's true, then why doesn't he just turn, why doesn't he just turn into plutonium every time and that the fight's over? Yeah. So it's, you know, the, the reality of Metamorpho, if you haven't read the most recent issues of World's Finest is he's a, he's a man whose inner, you know, elements, inner chemicals were just scrambled. And so, he still had, he can only turn into the elements that are in the human body, which is about 10 to 12 main elements, oxygen, carbon, so forth. And then about 30 or 40 trace elements like gold or, or what have you. And he can turn into any number of combinations. And so it's fun for me to look at that as a puzzle. It's fun for me to look at that as, okay, I have some chemistry background and I've 
willing to do my research. What can we do here that is interesting that, you know, other elemental characters in, in comics can't do. Right. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times about combinations, and that is also a central theme of this series. Oh, because nice. not only have we gotten that, but we've gotten a couple of uh, uh, combinations. We got combo. Uh, we got uh, a, a, a take on composite Superman, where we got yep. the uh, hey. Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, uh, and the Metal Men Batman that just yeah. debuted, which was awesome. Now, are you hey. thinking specifically because uh, Todd McFarlane is really excited about making these toys, or is this just <laughs> something you've always wanted to see? It's, because I feel I, like there's no way we're not going to see that Metal Men figure. I would hope not. I mean, it's it's they're not designed to be toyetic. I mean, it's not right. like my first thought is, how can I make a toy in this issue and then fit it into the... It's more, what kind of visuals have we never seen before? I've never sure. seen, you know, Batman in a Metal Men armored suit. So... But yes, I I stand by my porch like Calvin waiting for his beanie in the mail, hoping <laughs> that at some point McFarlane will send me a Batman covered in metal men armor. Yes. <laughs> I love that reference. Thank you for referencing yeah. Calvin and Hobbes, man. Uh, yeah. I, I figured there's no way you wouldn't be a fan. No. Uh, are you excited for the Bill Watterson book that's coming out soon? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I pre-ordered I, it, obviously. I, I have no idea what it's going to be. Do you have, do you have, have any such, inkling? Such respect. I have such respect for that guy who just said, no merchandise, nothing. I want it to, to just be a comic strip, which is why there's not a million cartoons and you know collections and T-shirts and teddy bears and stuff out there. Yep. I mean, it would be cool to have merch. But I don't resent him that we don't. I instead look at that as like, well, that's real creative integrity that you have decided this is what you want and you won't let any you won't let the syndicates bend you to their will. Yeah. And stuck to it for this many yeah. years. You know, and it was uh, all these years. Yeah. Right. Because we all like kind of got the window into Waterson thanks to the 10 year anniversary. But that right. was like 20 years ago. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's amazing to see him stick to it. And since then, having a kid and, and not letting that in any way affect, you know, he's like, OK, well, I had the kid. Uh, time to churn out them Calvin and Hobbes's. <laughs> right. Although who knows what happens when he dies? Maybe there will suddenly be a stampede. And I well, hope, not, you know, it was, uh, certainly uh, we've heard rumors about things like uh, Spielberg wanting to make a Calvin and Hobbes adaptation and right. like, different different people that I would trust with certain properties. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think that. The hope is that it wouldn't end up like the Peanuts movie, where right. it's, uh, you know, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Is it? Is it? I, I hope it's timeless. I feel like it is. But I you feel know. like it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we could talk about uh, uh, more DC, but I'd really like to straight to to kind of sure. lean, go over across the aisle a little bit if that's okay sure. with you um be, and this is this is entirely because uh recently we did an episode about marvel a couple of years a couple of months ago and uh, i know <laughs> i know you have nothing to do with it yeah. uh but uh but it opened up a bill gemma sized can of worms and it made uh the the research all the more fun but i'd heard a rumor that he pitched you or that he pitched a Fantastic Four idea and that that was kind of fell that fell on your shoulders. The idea that the Fantastic Four were like not powerless, but rather take them out of the city, put them in the suburbs, make them mundane and milk toast. Is that the idea? Was that the idea? Where did it come from? And yeah, it wasn't so much a pitch as it was an edict. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, Tom Brevoort, Michael Ringo, Carl Kiesel, and I were cooking on the Fantastic Four book back in the day. We just yeah. launched it long ago. And Bill got it in his crazy ass head that he wanted a complete tonal change from everything. And he wanted us to start treating the fantastic. Suddenly they're in the suburbs and they're treated like sad sacks. And Sue is a secretary, literally yeah. a secretary. And, you know, Johnny is, you know, a fireman and <laughs> Ben is working construction and cra and Reed is the wacky guy who keeps inventing things like a waterless fish tank. And uh, and Doom is like the the crazy next door neighbor, like you know Mrs. Kravitz and <laughs> Bewitched. Yeah. And Tom and I looked at this, and we're like, "This is this is like Olympic level bad." Yeah. But that said, I put on my big boy shoes, you know, and I and I sat there and I worked out a story arc that we could do pretty quickly that would encompass all of these ideas and yet make sense of them and so forth. And 
Tom went back to Bill and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And Bill said, nope, he's fired. <laughs> and so, you know, for the first time ever, I was fired off a book. Yeah. Uh, and Michael Ringo, God bless him, my friend, in solidarity said, well, if Mark's not on it, I'm not on it anymore. Yeah. And the the fan outcry was amazing to me. I mean, we the phrase break the internet has become a joke, but we literally did break the internet because <laughs> all of the news sites crashed that weekend. Comic yeah. resources crashed that weekend. And it was kind of like being Tom Sawyer at his own funeral, right? I get to hear all these wonderful things about how much they love Fantastic Four and how much they love my work, which is really nice. Um, and so the timing of it worked out really nice where we didn't stay fired. I didn't stay fired for long. Right. Like Bill, Bill was out of there not too long afterwards. Like w I, I want to say within weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of Joe Casada's first acts was to pull me aside and say, really sorry, you know, can you come <laughs> back? And Mike had gone on to take on a little, some other side thing so that, he wasn't able to come back immediately like I was, so which is why we have that authoritative action arc that Howard Porter did a great job on as a film yeah. arc. And then Mike came back. But yeah, those were crazy Uncle Bill. Uh, those, were, <laughs> those were interesting times. Yeah, yeah. And I know that uh, it wasn't all thanks to the Fantastic Four debacle that saw Bill leaving the room. Now, my question is, do you think... <sighs> Do you think that that edict that yeah. came from there was that an idea that from that, that sprung from the well of creativity, such that it was dry as it was? But do you think that was like one of those last like I'm out? Like, he knows it. No, 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 no. I, gotta... I think I think it came from a sincere place. I think that the word "well" is probably doing a lot Generous. of heavy lifting in that <laughs> sentence. I think the, maybe mm -hmm. the bottle cap of <laughs> creativity is probably mm -hmm. a little more active, actively way of put, uh, accurate way of putting it. So yeah. And again, look, I, Oh, no shade. Yeah. I'm not, no uh, shade. And I choose like, here's, I mean, I, I, I can go on a rant about it because it's funny and because right. I can make you laugh by doing a rant about it. But the reality is I'm not bitter about it. I mean, there's, if there's, I've been in this business for 35 years, almost 40 years. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. 40 years. <laughs> And if I spent time being bitter about things that didn't go my way, I would not be able to move. I would right. be, I would be, you know, just pinned down by the weight of all of this. I see there are a couple of older guys in comics who I will not name who need a semi to carry around their grudges with them. And yeah. it's sad and it's, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And you see how, how, out of touch they become that's the other yeah. thing about being bitter and angry is it takes you very much out of touch with the modern state of comics and right. and the only way to stay relevant is to just you know embrace what comics are becoming embrace the fact that you can go to the store and pick up a bunch of comics on a wednesday and none of them are quite like the ones you would do but that doesn't make them bad there's the there's the thing and it, it we complain about fans not being able to find that line right but a lot of older pros can't find that line either which is look there is a difference between i don't like it and it's bad there's a difference between i'm not the audience and this sucks there's yeah. a difference between those things and i choose to just accept a lot of times that this is a well-crafted comic but i'm not the audience or this isn't a well-crafted comic, but it's selling and therefore somebody is plugging into it. And rather than be resentful that the audience is buying something that I think is crap, instead I try to get in there like a surgeon and take it apart and figure out, okay, what is it about this thing? What are the elements about this thing that people are keying into and how can I recognize that? If there, and is there any way to apply that to my own work on a, on a micro level. Mm, mm. I love that because as a fan from mm -hmm. back in the day myself and being on the side of comic book criticism today, yeah. 
I have gained a new appreciation for books that I and many of the people that were my compliment but 20 years ago yeah. would have dismissed as crap or right. boring sure. or whatever, right? Because sure. like, your only avenue for getting that information was like the comic shop news, your local comic book store retailer, fans, right. maybe a periodical about a wizard. Right. But like otherwise that's it. And so you have these authority figures that are just kind of like, oh, don't read this one. It sucks. And it's like, oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I wouldn't know any better. So that's that. But today the discourse has become such more nuanced. I think, or at least I hope that criticism has become nuanced in, enough yeah. to be like, no, you know what? This is a good book and I'm not the audience. Which is, and again, you could, I don't need to take off my shoes to count the number of on my on my digits to count the number of people who can recognize that but right. i hope that people do yeah yeah because and i think it, well, go it's ahead. Not, and it's not just that it's a more realistic way of looking at it it's a way that will keep you from being angry right you know? yes it's a way yes. that will it doesn't make your life any better to be resentful about comics that you don't like if you don't like it just accept the fact that you're not the audience and don't read it it's okay yeah do you think that, because uh, you mentioned how uh, being bitter kind of affects it, does it affect the work? Oh, God, yes. I mean, there's a, you know, I can point to a bunch of work out there, again, from creators who are either older or more experienced or maybe a little burned out that a lot of them just read like revenge comics. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a couple of creators and I'm like, again, I'm not going to name names who no, of course. have made a cottage industry out of writing comics that are thinly veiled criticisms of other people in comics, other events in comics, other things in comics. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't, I can't come down on you for biting the hand that feeds you because sometimes it's actually kind of funny work, but why 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 <laughs> right well and once you've gotten that out of your system like what else do you have to say like you know yeah. what's the what's the where's the real stuff like what's the right. story you right. really want to tell me this sucks is not is not a series you know <laughs> can't really run with that yeah yeah um apropos of our chat about the you know kind of being kicked off a book and then getting to do it again, it reminded mm -hmm. me of the Captain America run. Right. And how uh, that was kind of a book that was doing great. Yeah. And then due to work, due to deals that were made without your involvement. Right. Uh, and a Captain America beginning of Heroes Are Born yeah. and then brought in. Did you uh, just... Just this is just a, a curiosity scratching, but like, did you have big plans pre cancellation that you got to pay off, or was it just another day at the office for you? Were you like, when you got back on to Captain America, were you was, like, it, eh, I'm just all right, what's the next story for Cap? Like, yeah, it really was that. I mean, I didn't, yeah. I, I wish I could say that I planned ahead much further than I do, but I tend mm -hmm. not to because I like the spontaneity of solving the problem in front of me that month, yes. So yes. I didn't really have a long-term plan that that sort of interrupted that I recall, mm -hmm. but I do know that when we launched back into it after Heroes Reborn, it was all brand new stuff. It was all, okay, I got nothing in the bank. Let's <laughs> start again. Yeah. Um, you seem to enjoy this like belief that I have espoused over the years about um, art from adversity, the idea of, um, you know, there being restrictions in place that help make the work better. Yeah. Uh, do you prefer some kind of restraint or having been in a position where you've been able to go, I'm sure you've gotten pitches where it's just, tell me what you want to do and yeah. we will publish it. Yeah. Uh, is, there a, is there a preferred lane for you? Yeah. When you tell me, you know, do whatever you want, I freeze. I, I, sure. I'm not saying this is applicable to all creators. I'm not saying this is applicable to all situations, but just speaking personally, if you give me some guide rails, I work better because again, solving problems is, is what motivates me. I mean, getting up in the morning and going, okay, this is the situation the character is in, or this is the situation the story is in. What happens next? How do I get them out of this? How do I make this better? How do I get this piece of, 
information across? How do I get this exposition across? What's a clever way of making this visual when it's just two people talking? Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that really motivates me and, and I enjoy because again, puzzle solving, problem right. solving, that's the fun part. So once you open it up to me and go, all right, whatever you want to do, I'm suddenly like a deer in the headlights. I, I don't know. You know, I'm <laughs> sure if you gave me enough time, I could figure out something. Mm -hmm. you know you know empire and potter's field and stuff like that didn't just you know spring out of nowhere it had to be in me somewhere but sure. you know it i i do work better when you give me just some some guardrails i'm like yogurt i need a little starter culture of some sure. sort i'm like sourdough bread yeah 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 uh you gotta have some kind of mother broth to start with yeah. do you uh do you that being said do you have a bunch of pitches like always kind of like in the bank, so to speak, where you're like, oh, that's an idea. Let me write that down, make sure I have it that way. One yeah, day. I've got a half a dozen things in my hip pocket. Yeah, that, that eventually I will get around to exploring um, that aren't, you know, that are creating their own stuff. There's still some stuff in the bank, but still some bullets in that chamber. Good. But I, you know, I, I, it's also, I'm also different than my peers. Not all of them, as near as I can tell, that what I enjoy is not storytelling. What I enjoy is being able to play in this world. Mm. Um, I didn't get into this to be a writer. I didn't ever consider I was going to be a writer. I didn't even consider writing comics until I was like 25 years old. Um, it never occurred to me to be something I could do. And so it's the motivation for me personally, and I probably unique is as near as I can tell is that it's not about, Oh, I'm an artist, but I have a burning story to tell and a burn and a lot of things I want to say that can't be said except through my own creations. No, I still have all a lot of things to say. I still have a lot of burning desire to tell stories, but I enjoy telling them through the lens of these characters that meant so much to me when I was a kid. That now it's my chance to sort of give back to that to that mm. world. Because I've noticed that uh, the the current kind of culture of comic book creation has kind of blurred the line between you know sole proprietorship and uh you know creating your own brand as opposed to being like a like a hired gun so to speak you know part of the bullpen and uh, frankly i you know i get it you know am i do i have a little twinge of jealousy when i go into a comic book store and i see you know, here's the Garth Ennis shelf, and here's the Alan Moore shelf, and here's the Mark Miller shelf, and here's the, you know, Ed Brubaker shelf, and there is no Mark Wade shelf, even though I've written more <laughs> than like any two of those people than, put together. Yeah, double that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, but... I'm, I think there's a Mark Wade shelf at this point. Come on. You would... No. <laughs> I have yet to see. If you're a store that has a Mark Wade shelf, contact me, and... And I'll, <laughs> and I'll sign them. And I'll sign yeah. them for whatever, but they're, I'm, I don't expect a stampede of responses to that. Um, but... I'm, I, I do look back on my career and sometimes I do wish that I had maybe worked harder to create more of a brand around myself be mm. only because it would be nice to be held in that regard. I, um, I don't see how you couldn't be at this point, given that you, uh, I, I think that you're part of the pantheon at this point. You're you're very kind. I I mean I'm I'm not trying to blow smoke or anything like that, no. you know. But I but I mean like it's you know your influence and, is here and it is and, like people lamenting things that are happening today or due to the 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 bedrock you laid for them before. And we're well, not talking fifty years ago here. You know, we're right, only talking right. like twenty years ago. You know, which is well. And I and I thank you for that. I think that I maybe that's true, but it would it would have been easier to get there if I had not just been one hundred percent a hired gun. Right. You know, that in especially in the early days of my career would just any assignment that came my way that looked even remotely interesting, I would jump on rather than think in terms of I wonder how this will help build my, my career, which is not yeah. not an inv not an invalid way of looking at it. I mean, I'm like it's not to come down on people who more strategically plan the arc of their career. God bless sure. you. But it's just not something that I also come from an era in comics and comics creation where nobody did that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that language wasn't written yet, I don't think. Yeah, you know? it, it, 
Trippy entrepreneurial music. spirits, I'm sure, exist. I mean, the right the, the closest thing we can compare it to is like the image revolution, right? It's like right. all but you didn't draw. So that's no. <laughs> I came in a time, I came in at a time when as near as I can remember, you know, Kurt Busick, me, and Scott Lobdell were the only three writers yeah. to come into the business in that pocket of time because everybody else wanted to be an artist because image right. had blown up and everybody sees that's where the money is. And that so again, we didn't think in terms of well, how do we strategically build that our brand. Or, yeah. it's, it's just you know, just you know, an assignment. I'm a freelancer, awesome. You know, I need to pay my rent. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh okay. So really quick, I want to talk about Flash because uh <laughs> as much as I'm not the world's biggest Flash fan, it's one of those things where it's like interviews I, over. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I think you'll find it to be quite complimentary, despite the fact that uh, right. Flash yeah. is not it's not my yeah, guy, pull, but I will. Yeah, I, go ahead. just pull out of this dive. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Wally West and the reason why people love him today is, despite the fact that you came on his book, you know, midway, yeah, sixty issues uh, in or whatever. Yeah. Exactly, sixty issues. Yeah, uh, that Wally West became Wally West under your watch. Yeah. Thank and, you. but what was your feeling about the Flash family? During that time, because in that time, you're like, all right, I'm going to define who Wally West is. And I'm going to add people like Max Mercury and so forth. Yeah. Like, what was you? Because I think that it's funny to me how in the age of superhero families, the Marvel mm -hmm. family, the uh, the Bat family, Super, the Superman, Superman family, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That the Flash family is one of those things that, you know, some folk, myself included, are kind of like, ah, the Bat family's getting a little bloated, et cetera. But yeah. like the Flash family, Flash fans seem to go, another guy who can run? Welcome to the family. Like everybody, yeah. see, the Flash fans seem to be really, really big on more speedsters. Right. What, do you, well, what do you attribute that to, if you've noticed? That they're different, that they may have the same powers, but they are markedly different characters. That that is... I look back and I and I didn't realize this until many years later, but I, I think that the reason the Flash family sort of was created gradually through my run was because I was probably hearkening back to what I loved about Silver Age Superman stuff, where it's mm -hmm. Supergirl and Super Dog and the Bottle City Candor and you know all these so the Superman family existed uh, yeah. before you know and before John Byrne came and did his reboot. And I kind of like that. And so I think I was probably subconsciously building that. But more than that, I just, I, I like those characters, but I think that they are different than Wally. And I think that rather than, there's two ways of doing it. If you put enough, if you, you can screw up and you can put enough of those characters in a book where the main character becomes irrelevant. Sure. And where the main character becomes like just another one of that pack and loses their, their specialness. Or you can approach it where each of those characters does something or is something or behaves in some way that illustrates how unique and special the main character is. Because it's not about their powers. It's, it's about who they are as people. It's about their personalities. And so I would argue that the reason the Flash family worked is because everyone added to the Flash pantheon there during that time was different enough from Wally in personality and motivation and in background or whatever that it just underscored how unique Wally was. Yeah. Do you have a favorite issue from that run that you just yeah, kind of like? Yeah, Flash Zero, easily. Yeah. Really? The Zero issue? Yeah. The Zero Hour? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Flashing back? That's that cool. came from, yeah, I mean, it came from... That's where Ringo, you know, right? Yeah, it's Ringo. I have I have the pages. I have several pages on my wall, framed on my wall, because cool. there's a sequence in there that was just from my own life. I, I I went back. I was this is again many many years ago when I was driving around Alabama where I grew up and and drove up to the house I lived in when I was like ten years old, and I was there for a moment and I was just nobody was home. I was just kind of standing by the side of the road looking at this house. And there was such a part of me, there was a huge part of me that wanted nothing more in that moment than to be able to walk into the backyard and find 10 year old Mark Wade and tell him good news. You know, everything's going to work out. Good news. Don't fret about stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. In the end of the day, you're going to get all the things you want in life, which is how I felt at the time. 
And that just, that became a scene in that issue. That became a scene that again, I've got those pages on the wall to remind me why I love what I do. And so that's, that's why Wally works. Wally works in that time period because there's a voice behind him because I connected with him as a character because I was able to work things through with him as a character because we were the same in the sense that, you know, no, what can I run, you know, down the block without losing my breath? No, but are we were both fans who made good, right? Like yeah. that's what Wally was. Wally was a super fan of the flash who wanted nothing more than to be in that world. And he was, he yeah. got it. Same as me, same as most. And I think that's another reason why Wally subconsciously appeals to a lot of fans is that they see in him that what they want to be, they want to be the fan who gets to be a big, a big part of the actual thing that they're, they're a fan of. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Do you think that, um, cause I think that you just, stumb- you just, uh, struck on a, on an item that I, tend to not really notice which is when you're writing a character Mm -hmm. you need to infuse a big portion of yourself in them or in order to make them at least a small portion you need you need to invest something of yourself in that character you you can write without doing that but then they become leaden and they become that's the thing right like then 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 your run isn't going to be 90 issues it's going to be like it's really not Exactly. You have this is what the advice I give to younger writers is you, you whether you created that character or not, you've got to find something in you that and something in that character that it, that is common, something mm-hmm. that you can connect to emotionally with that character. Because if you can't, then there's yeah, like you said, you're going to get you know five crappy issues out of it. And you're going to move on. You yeah, know? yeah. Is that why there aren't a ton of Batman books by Mark Wade? <laughs> <laughs> that's why there, that's why there's no Wonder Woman books by Mark Way. That's why there's no Thor books by Mark Way. There's no yeah, yeah. and again this not to criticize those characters. They're great. Well, of course, characters, just but there's I'm no a, I'm a science boy and so I can't I can't hook into the mythology on a on a mythological level. I just can't yeah. I can't make that reach. So I've never been able to find the commonality between me and Thor. I've never been able to find the commonality between me and Wonder Woman. So I don't Maybe it's there. Maybe I just haven't found it yet. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I hadn't found it between me and Mr. Fantastic until I really thought about it. And then I, mm-hmm. I locked onto it. But yeah, I mean, and with Batman, there's another reason why there's not a ton of Batman Mark Wade books out there is because, and I told Tom King this, and it paralyzed him. It <laughs> really paralyzed him creatively for like weeks there have been more stories told about Batman than about any other character in Western literature, in the history of Western literature. Way more stories, more than Sherlock Holmes, more than Hercules, more than, you know, yes, Hercules has been around a lot longer, but how many Hercules stories are there really? Exactly. <laughs> more than more than any other fictional character. I said Western mythology, but probably world mythology. Yeah. And so it is very, very difficult to find a new angle, to find a new story, to find something new to do with that character. It's not impossible. People do it every month. But, <laughs> oh, my God, is it much harder work than it is for Flash or Plastic Man or the Metal Men or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although you did manage to do that mm-hmm. uh, in a Justice League book, of all things, yeah. and end up uh, incidentally or deliberately uh, telling what one of the most single defining stories for Bat, like you, you that that ended up defining Batman as a character for a generation. Good or bad. Yes. Right. You know, yeah, exactly. Know. Because people minus. were like, yeah. 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 right, because he, he never wasn't associated with being a fanatic who. Right would betray those closest to him right. uh and it's thanks to tower Babel. did that was that your was was the goal to tell a big story that was going to impact it like that or was it like no here's no, a justice league idea but a batman probably like, that's really it it's just a league idea i mean I, I i don't ever sit down and go what's a story i can tell that has big sweeping impact because yeah i well, don't I, I guess i I yeah, guess I should but, say did you expect it to have the impact that it did? no no i really didn't i you know and again you know, same with Kingdom Come. Same with the idea that I see that 
people have drawn from it a lot of good ideas. And I see that people have drawn a lot of bad ideas from it too. Like it's not a, it's not a recipe, you know, it's not, it's, right. a, it's a cautionary fable. And the same with Tower of Babel. I think that it stands alone as a, as a nice character piece. It was what I wanted to say about Batman does using it as a foundation for the idea that Batman is a complete asshole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that's that, you know, I, I, I can't bear any responsibility for that. Exactly. People, you know, any more than, you know, Alan Moore, not to compare myself, but Alan Moore can bear responsibility for all the crappy Watchmen esque, you know, rip offs out there, yeah. rip off kind of <laughs> ideas. So uh, yeah, it, it was just an idea. It was just, it all came from the visual of Bruce walking up to his parents' grave and they'd been exhumed and they were gone. Sure. The stone coffins were gone, which is an idea I had for so long that really? and no place to put it. And yeah, every month I would open up my Batman comics and pray that no one else had thought of it yet. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an idea that is, I think it works so well in a Justice League story because how do you get Batman to lay off? How do you get him to yeah. like extricate himself from the story? Uh, make it about his parents and he will immediately, yeah. his attention is diverted. <laughs> right. Also the uh, thing about that story that, that gets lost is that it's people seem to misinterpret. And I tried mm-hmm. to course correct on this with, few, with ensuing issues, but you know, Batman's sin was not that he came up with the contingencies, it was- contingency plans. That's not a bad thing to do. I am sure that Superman would want you to have a contingency plan in case something went horribly wrong with him. Yeah. And it's only Batman's crime was not telling the, his friends that there is something in place. Not specifically, just don't worry, I've got it covered. That was the part, that was what drove him away from the Justice League. That's where the rest of the Justice League was like, we now you creep us out yeah (laughs) Yeah. um you seem to have more reverence i mean you seem to have a lot of reverence for dc for the justice league obviously superman is the big one sure um i want to jump into superman but before we do uh i know you're a big fan of superman lore what would you say because superman is one of those amazing characters that i think you know as you tapped Alan Moore, I'll, I'll, I'll do it as well. You know, Alan Moore seems to have a real uh, negative idea about the influence the superhero comics, Western comics have had on Western civilization, fascism and whatnot. But I, I think, think you could, uh, I think you could have stopped that sentence with Alan Moore seems to have a negative idea. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But I think, you know, he's always pushed into saying something negative because people are like, well, I don't get people to click on that. If, you know, grouchy yeah. wizard, yeah, you know, yells at cloud, That's true. but, uh, you know, but but I think that Superman and 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 the ideas behind that character, I love that he's like almost a patchwork character. You know, some like psycho, some of the iconography comes from radio, some of it comes from the movies. You know, the crystals are just a, whoop, you know, yeah. Dick Donner's like here. How about this? Right. Uh, but everything that we know about Superman today, and it's which is why I think it's so funny when people say like, you know, that's not Superman. Like, you know, I'm like, well, what is? What period? What are you is? Picking? Yeah. Uh, but what's one of your favorite pieces of iconography from Superman's mythology? The fortress, man. That that fortress, really? Well, I guess because it speaks to you as an author, you're like, well, I like to be able to get away. There's so many toys in there. And actually, my very first story for DC was a fortress story. So um, back in the day, my pitch to DC, and again, this is back when DC was doing very simple Superman stories. There was a period before Burn, yeah, where the Superman books were doing okay, not great. And the mandate editorially for about a year, year and a half was, well, the German publishers who reprint our stuff are doing gangbusters with Superman Hmm. material. And so DC produced a lot of material that was only printed overseas and has never seen the light of day in English, sadly. Um, And I guess I had to stop. And (laughs) in the main books, Action and Superman, the edict was we want self-contained, you know, very, not simple, but, you know, non-complicated 16 and eight page stories. That's what we right. want. You know, easy to book. translate. <laughs> yeah. Easy to train, easy to translate, easy to plug in, you know, wherever they need to be plugged in and in, in publishing. And so my pitch to editor Julie Schwartz at the time was Superman opens up the door to the Fortress of Solitude and there's nothing in there. Who is burgled? who was stolen from the Fortress of Solitude. And that was enough of a hook for him 
to say, go write that story. And that, you know, without that, I would be serving French fries right now. <laughs> I would, that would be that would be my job. Um, so I love the fortress, which is why if you look around my house, there's the Phantom Zone projector, you know, there's a bunch of crystal, there's a bunch of, I, I do have my share of props around. Yeah. I am a big, big fan of like screen accurate, page accurate props of that kind of stuff. And I live in a town, you know, Los Angeles, Hollywood, where there are people who do this stuff and make this stuff. So yes, uh, I, have, I have my share of, of fortress toys. Yeah. That's really cool. That's something I've always wanted. I, I, uh, you know, you've, the studio uh while you only see the actor you know the the video games yeah. it's similar where i i get to like put up all these all, all these like monuments to to my fandom and interests and i yeah. i've always wanted to have like like a an ultimate nullifier and yeah. uh i assume you have the bottle city of candor that they made a while back that like, I, cool. yes yes and my 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 dream is to finally get around to somebody having made for me a full size one i just one of those yeah. things i just is on my list of bucket you know bucket list of things to get made so yeah yeah, yeah i really want one of those yeah. um yeah it's so cool man awesome <laughs> yeah. uh apropos of superman um what are some of your favorite recent superman books that have come out that are not by you that you're like i think is. that i i've liked a, i've liked a lot of what's been done in the last few years i think that Frank right? johnson has a really good hook on that character i think that tom taylor does i think that josh williamson's new run is really good yeah um i think that there is you know there's a there's a post bendis intent to sort of get back to the things about the character that really work and are mainstays of the character, like a secret identity, you know, um, <clears throat> about which I could go on for a long time. Oh, I'll bet. Uh, yeah, man. I, I feel like, I, I feel like Ben has tried to put a kind of classic spin on that character without really, I don't know, seeing the forest of the trees. I think it got away from him, but like, you know, there's uh, the, the Ivan Rice art is fantastic, but yeah. uh, the, you know, I don't know about Rogelzar, but uh... I think that I think that, and again, I you know Brian's a friend of mine. I we've not spoken about this, but excuse me, <clears throat> but my educated guess about the secret identity is that it came from a very good place. I think yes. that the idea of revealing it came from a very good place. I would guess, knowing Brian, that it came from a place of we want to live in a world where we remind kids that they need to be their true selves, that it's okay to be their true selves and not hide who they are not feel yeah. closeted. And I think that that's where that idea probably came from. And I think it is a valid idea and I think it's an interesting approach. I'm not, I'm not sure that it was, that Superman was the best character to explore that through. Cause I think that the Superman Clark Kent dynamic is one of the things that makes that character unique in comics um because superman is is that a real guy and clark is the disguise and fight me yeah um, so it's been I, my attitude toward any of these characters that have been around for you know 30 40 50 60 70 years is don't break it like right there's something about that character that is working and you may think you know what it is but we don't know what it is because if we knew exactly what it was, we'd be making characters like that right now that are going to last another 70 years. And we don't. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some X factor there that, you know, just be careful, treat them, not, you know, be play with them, gloves, but morph yeah. them, knock them around, but don't, you know, don't feel like you have to wear kid gloves, but at the same time, you know, try to, you, you're not going to be in charge of this character forever. So try to leave the toy in the same state and found them for the next person to take yeah sure sure uh what do you think it is about the longevity of a new character like a character that's created with the intent of being like welcome to the pantheon here's a new character and like you know how it's so rare that they will yeah. stay that they'll stick right. around or that right. they won't I mean, be who, who have we got in the last you know 30 40 years 50 right. years we got punisher we got deadpool yeah, yeah you know, firestorm the, the the titans i mean but who do we have in the last 10 years i nobody comes immediately to mind although i'm sure it's, there's some 
Yeah. Oh yeah, it's tough. But it, well, you know, what's interesting is the first ones that I'll bet people would name in the comments mm -hmm. down below. If you want to leave a mm -hmm. comment, feel free. Uh, is that that uh, is sidekicks because they're connected to an already established thing, right? You know, so right. it's like you can't you can't go wrong when you make another Robin. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's just it's it's hard because you know the audience is is what it is, and it's not terribly accepting of brand new characters. Um, yeah. and they may say they are and they're not. And nope. also you can only go wrong if you, as a creator, sit down and go, I'm going to create a brand new character that is going to be a huge sensation. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the wrong way to do it, you know, because then manage your expectations, man, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, it's hard to do. So the more, you try to make it for everybody and the more you try to make it big and you know, this is going to be the next big thing. You don't have any control over that. So no. you're, you know, just manage your expectations, just create a great, a great new character and watch it slowly take off. You know, exactly. Yeah. I mean, even the influence, uh, I mean, you created Bart Allen, you know how yeah. exciting and cool he can be only to be forgotten for a good, like, eight to ten right. but but i don't think that was the culture's decision i think that had a lot to do with just like the desires of the people who were in charge and what oh they very much so priority, yeah. you know yeah we but, went through uh, yeah we went through here period, to... no, we, yeah we went through a period of dc where there was no room for fun or or legacy. Or yeah. yeah um the you know when what happens in those cases is that see here's the cycle okay I didn't sit down to create impulses like, okay, this is going to be the next big thing. I just created a character impulse because I thought it would be a cool idea. And so what happens with these characters, almost without fail, is that they have a short lifespan and then they sort of go out of vogue. And then what happens 10, 15 years later is that the fans who were reading this character and love this character become creators. Mm -hmm. And then they want to bring these characters back and so then they become bigger people forget that dark side was off the board kirby was here for 71 72 73 uh with dark side the new gods and all that fourth world stuff and then you know dark side was a footnote for a long time until paul levitz and keith giffen who were huge huge kirby fans said, let's do something with Darkseid and the Legion of Superheroes. Right. And that put him back on the map. There's a million examples I could come up with of okay. characters that just, you know, here for a brief time, gone. Yeah. And then a bunch of creators look back on the stuff they loved and are like, okay, I got something to do. I, I, there's something I can do with, I can do with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, apropos of forgotten characters and new creations and dc mm -hmm. uh you were tapped to launch dc's often uh, forgotten impact comics uh imprint the comet yes uh, and i remember picking up the fly mm -hmm. off of a 7-eleven shelf when i was a yeah. kid down the shore and i was like this is really fun and i remember even as a kid like as a kid you know and yeah. that, that those books the, the impact comics suite of books that came out at that time mm -hmm. were um a breath of fresh air because they had kind of like a retro vibe, but a modern mm -hmm. spin on art. So it was, you know, yeah. accessible by, for kids, but also was antithetical to the grim dark approach right. that pretty much everybody was was taking at that time. So I was like, oh, this is nice. Yeah. Um, what do you, what, can you speak to the creation and, and development of that impact period for a little while? Because I don't know anybody who remembers and talks about it. Yeah. I and mean, nobody does. It's right. They were, I mean, they were some good comics. They were done yeah. by some you know, really great creative people, you know, Mike Parabek alone, you know, on the flight was worth yeah. a dozen artists I could, you know, name today. Um, a lot of good people in those books, a lot of good thought. It was well intended as a sort of a standalone line that was made, as you say, for slightly younger characters that was not grim and gritty, not goofy, not no. silly, but, you know, it's real stakes, real, yeah. you know, real drama but it the market just wasn't there for that material it just wasn't there something that's very telling people forget is that the impact line launched the same exact day oh as His image no as as jim shooter's valiant line oh with, with magnus robot fighter yeah 
the Valiant Line went on to sell a billion comic books. Yeah. Impact was gone in 18 months. <laughs> and so it had nothing to do with, with the talent attached. It was just the market was not interested in A, you know, stuff that was out of continuity, B, stuff that was designed for slightly younger readers, you know, C, stuff with a, a look to it that wasn't Frank Miller, wasn't dark, right. wasn't grim and gritty. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I'm waiting for that uh, revolution to come back, but I don't think anybody remembers that stuff. So I'm like, <laughs> no, I mean, and, and they, and those who do, I mean, there's, there's also, there's no way to make that happen because Archie, Con those were licensed characters from Archie comics. Yes. And that license lasted for about two years until it wasn't something that Archie was interested in continuing. And it wasn't worth DC's expense to continue licensing because the books weren't doing that well. Mm -hmm. And there's been attempts to bring in those characters back. I mean, you know, during the Dan Dio era, there was yeah. that big move where a lot of those characters showed back up in the DC line. Um, but again, you know, sank without a trace. No, yeah. no, no criticism of the creators, just sank without a trace. We, ha we have approval to talk a little bit about some of your upcoming books and sure. your, your, your discretion to talk about them. But uh, Teen Titans, can we talk about that for a minute? Oh, man. Emma Lupacino is, is so good as an artist. She's so good. <laughs> and she's she loves these Titans characters, and I love them. And so it really just came from, look, we had so much fun with them in World's Finest. Yeah. And editorial came to me and said, let's do something with this. Let's do something to expand the world's finest umbrella, create its own, start to create its own little corner of the DC universe. And we love these Titans characters. What can you do? Well, I love those characters. Titans growing up has always, always been one of my favorite books, even back in the 1960s. I love that comic yeah. and doing sitting down and thinking about those characters as a team, as how they relate to each other as people, what is the relationship between Wally West and Roy Harper? What is the relationship between Donna and Dick Grayson? For the first time, really thinking about those things, it's just a wealth of stories just sprang forth. They're just such good, rich characters. And so that's where that came from. And they had, you know, an edict from DC that turned into, yes, that's something I very much want to do. <laughs> and I, I love what we've what we've done so far. We're about halfway through, you know, the first six issues at this point. And nice. it, it looks great. It is everything I want it to be because it is less about punching than it is even more so than most of my comics, which are very rarely about punching, but mm -hmm. it, it's less about punching and more about the team dynamics of a bunch of very big personalities and sure. as teenagers and how they work or don't work. And, you know, the conflicts that you really couldn't do in the 60s and 70s because they weren't done that way. All superheroes were pure and good and nobody had anything bad to say about each other. But, you know, in, in the current time, you know, you can get into, OK, you know, Dick and Roy Harper hate each other, you know, for whatever <laughs> reason. Here's your here's what comes of that. Yeah. Yeah. The um, this this particular book, I'm excited because in World's Finest, you've taken an opportunity to really flesh out uh, Dick Grayson, uh, Supergirl, uh, you know, the sidekicks. Uh, yeah. They get they get some really great. Uh, in fact, some of them got uh, they, they got uh, full full issues dedicated yeah. to them and, and, yeah. their, and their interactions. Um, they seem more measured and. <laughs> you know, some like Dick Grayson seems like almost a more capable leader than Batman in the world's final series. I think he is. I think that that's the thing that the one thing that Dick is better at in, you know, as, as a grown up than yeah. Bruce Apple was, is being a team leader. Right. Is interpersonal relationships. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's capable of interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a scene in the third issue where, you know, Robin is complaining that Batman is basically taking him off the board for the next round of Titans adventures because he doesn't trust those kids. And Dick is like, well, you know, they if you if you were so intent on me being a good leader to them, it's very hard for me to lead them from inside the Batcave. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Uh, will Boy Thunder be making an appearance in this series? Not in this series, but okay. soon. Cool. Uh, because, of course, I don't think we can, we don't have to be around the bush about Boy Thunder anymore. Right. Boy Thunder will inevitably become uh, Magog, uh, which 
hooray what a great yeah. reveal what a great surprise um another bullet yeah. i had in the chamber for 25 years yes <laughs> i can't believe what a because and, and you know what's funny letting it bath letting it uh marinate for 25 years only made yeah. it better i think so it was I totally so out of left field no um, one saw it coming yes no no um and finally uh i will ask you about your black label superman we teased it last time we chatted but uh yeah. what can you tell us about the black label superman book it's there's not a whole lot I can tell you without just spilling the whole thing because sure. it's it, but it's basically I think people know the basic log line at this point, which is that Lex Luthor has contracted a terminal disease that he can't figure out how to solve. Mm -hmm. And he goes to Superman for help, not because he he's turned a new leaf, not because he suddenly decided that Superman's his pal, but because he knows that of all the people on Earth, Superman is the one person who cannot look at him and go. I'm not going to help you. Who cares? Let him go. <laughs> yeah. He can't, whereas 95% of the rest of the world wants Superman to say, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Why you yeah. go, go save a volcano, go stop a, you know, tidal wave. Don't help this guy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you don't have to kill him, but you don't have to save him. Right. Sentiment that I <laughs> Classic love. superhero line. Love right, when superheroes exactly. do that. Uh, that's so, a Hollywood trope though. That's right. Yeah. And so it's, and so it's, you know, Superman begrudgingly, having to take this task on what what's the cure and that allows us to go through the entire superman universe from the bottle city of candor to atlantis to the legion of superheroes of the future to a bunch of other you know the phantom zone to a bunch of other different it's be a travelogue throughout the the superman universe that brian hitch has a, a really interesting visual angle on a lot of these things that we've never seen it from that angle before so sure that's that's the pitch. That's the basic pitch. And it's three issues, three 48 pagers, um, bi-monthly, I think, to make sure that we've got plenty of Good breathing time. time, make sure that we hit all the deadlines, uh, all three scripts are in. I'm very fond of it. I think that it it's not my final word on Superman because I don't think there's ever going to be a final word on Superman for me, but it's certainly a, f a final word on certain aspects of how I see that character. Mm. Is it big? It's yeah, it's a big it's 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 one of those black label like bigger yeah physically bigger big. size. Yeah. Yay, good. I love when yeah. DC like splurges for those because yeah. you know it's it it's it's so remarkably different from anything else on the shelf. It gives the artist a chance to try something new. Yeah. Um you remember when they used to do that that's that thing where you had to turn the book sideways? Yeah, that I that that's no, <laughs> that, that's nobody likes that. I I assume yeah. the artists seem to like that. I'm sure there's some people who are like Man, how come nobody asked me to turn the book sideways and I can draw? Well, you know, when I go to the when I go to the movies, nobody makes me turn my head sideways to watch the screen. You know, mm -hmm. it just all it does is interrupt the flow of the reading. So, yep. anyway. <laughs> uh, and finally, besides Birthright, obviously, what uh, if any adaptations do you hope that the Superman Legacy movie will draw from? No, I mean it would be nice. It would be wonderful if they drew from Superman Birthright. It would be wonderful if they drew from if if James Gunn drew from all-star Superman, which I'm sure he is, which we, every yes, sense of seen what we get is that. I, of that. I have no idea what's, what's coming, what they're going to do, but, Oh no. But you know, Superman for all seasons, there's just so many good classic evergreen Superman stories out there. And you, you know, you can't go wrong by yeah. pulling pieces and elements out of, out of each of them. And I trust James Gunn a thousand percent to be able to bring that to the screen. Yeah. And have you seen flash? Not yet, mm. not yet. And so, if you tell me who, what today's spoiler is, I will kill you. I promise. I, I don't. I don't know. I saw an article that was pushed to me that was like, "Here's the thing." I'm like, "No." Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> I, wanna, yeah, I already know enough. I already know way too much as it is. So yeah. I'm going to. I'm going to the premiere in you know a few days before the the release, and I'm very excited about it. Really good. And and Jeff Johns, who obviously knows this movie backward and forward, just sat down at one point and said, "It's like they made a movie just for you." Night terrors. Yeah, that, one of the most recent things that you're working on as well. Yeah. Uh, what's what's your what's your uh, take on Night Terrors? Where are you on Night Terrors? It's we wanted to do something obviously scary and creepy, and Roger Cruz is doing the art, and he's doing great. Yeah, you know, Welcome Diaz doing the the inking, and it looks terrific. Um, rather than tonally interrupt the flow of what we're doing with Shazam, which is very light and very comedy centric and suddenly throw the captain into that. Mary Marvel is a character that also needs plenty of screen time because she's great. 
and I don't yes. want to in any way write her out of the series. So yeah. we thought, oh, Mary Marvel is our focused character from Night Terror Shazam. So it is, Love it. it is her nightmares. It is her darkness. It is her, you know, uh, hopefully a look into her character from an angle that we've not looked at before. Nice. All right. Check out Night yeah. Terrors, folks. I'm excited. I've seen so much art for Night Terrors just overall. Yeah. And there's, I think it's like a, it's, it's not unlike uh, the, uh, the events of old where it's like, it's four issues yeah. and there's a bunch of other stuff. Right. If you want to, uh, if you want you know. to, but it's a, it's a simple concept. It's why it works as a crossover. The best yeah. crossovers are just a very simple idea. Right. That that allow the cre- the other creative people who want to tie in the maximum amount of of elbow room to do something with, rather than feed them a million things they've got to accomplish in the story. At which point, it's like writing a grocery list. So, yeah. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. We really really appreciate it. Uh, is there anything else that you want to uh, throw out there to the audience? You want to tease uh, or or website they can go to? Uh, uh, they can go to markwade.com, which we will be revising to make it look like it was in the 21st century, you know, it comes from the 21st. So we'll be doing that soon. Uh, you can find me as Wade Mark on, on Instagram because a million years ago I took Mark Wade and then I can't find the password. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a few, you know, I'm on Twitter, but I don't I'm not really on Twitter. Um, yeah, Who is that's, anymore? It's, I'm easy to find. I'm, you know, I'm easy to find.